This episode is part of the pool's Local Officials Stronger Together podcast series. It's one way we serve local officials through integrity, public service, fiscal responsibility, and operational excellence. As always, please direct specific questions about coverage to your member services manager. Welcome to the TML Risk Pool's Stronger Together podcast. I'm Scott Houston, and today's topic is local governments and firearms avoiding a jam. This is the re-recording of information about local governments as employers allowing or prohibiting their employees to carry a handgun while at work. When we first came up with the idea to do these podcasts, I knew the first episodes needed to be about guns. Texans love guns. I love guns. But there's always confusion about this topic as it relates to local governments. The original firearms episodes dealt with those Texans who have a license to carry. That's because until the governor signed HB 1927 last month, a license holder was the only person who could carry a handgun in public. The only person being a citizen, of course. There are special rules that apply to law enforcement, judges, prosecutors, etc. But House Bill 1927 changed all that. The bill, which many call constitutional or permitless carry, is known formally as the Firearms Carry Act of 2021. It authorizes most Texans over 21 years of age who haven't been convicted of certain state or federal crimes to carry a handgun in a concealed manner or openly in a holster without the requirement to first obtain a handgun license. Those crimes and much more detail and all of this stuff are listed in the paper that accompanies this podcast. There's also a cheat sheet that has some of the basics. Interestingly, House Bill 1927 does not repeal license carry. Why would they leave that bureaucracy in place? Well, at least two reasons. One is reciprocity. Several other states still require a license to carry, and a Texan must have a Texas-issued license to carry to take advantage of that. And number two, ease of firearm purchase. License holders get to skip the subsequent background checks. The decision to leave licensing in place is also relevant to today's topic because some local governments might not want to allow unlicensed employees to carry while at work, but they may want to allow licensed employees to do so. And we'll talk about that in more detail. Here's what we usually do on these podcasts, and this episode will be no different. I'll give you an overview of laws that are relevant to local governments. Sometimes I'll hear from special guests, which I will today, and then give you a few action items at the end to make sure you're getting everything you can from our partnership. Each time we do one of these, we'll have detailed links or written information to go along with your action items. Okay, welcome back to the re-recording of Part 2 of Episode 2, Local Governments and Firearms. In Part 1, I talked about the very limited authority of local governments to regulate where citizens can carry on government property. In this episode, we'll talk about whether local governments can prohibit or allow employees to actually carry a gun while at work and how that can affect your workplace and your risk of a lawsuit. The law on the threshold question here is really simple. A local government as an employer can, but isn't required to, prohibit employee carry. It can also do so for volunteers and contractors. A local government can also adopt a written policy expressly allowing it, and a decent number have done so. The pool doesn't have a position on whether you should allow employee carry, but through the written materials that go along with this episode, we want to provide information on local government policies and things to consider. I'm joined again this time by Paul Chris from the pool's loss prevention department. Paul has over 30 years in law enforcement and now provides training for the pool in that area. Last time, Paul and I kind of lamented that the required class and shooting test to get a license isn't really that hard. Well, how the passage of a bill can really change our perception, right? Maybe, for purposes of deciding which employees can carry, those minimal licensing requirements actually are better than nothing. As a law enforcement trainer and a licensed to carry instructor, it's kind of my side hustle, at least you have somebody with eyes on the person saying, okay, they meet the minimum qualifications, they pass the test that tells them when and how and under what circumstances they can carry and where they can carry. And and they go through that. And it's not a hard test. I've never had anybody score below 80. And I've been teaching the class for three years. At least as an instructor, I've got eyes on you and I can see you pull the trigger and handle the gun. And if you do make a mistake, I can correct it. But if you're going to have everybody out there who can purchase a gun, carry the gun, 
under the same circumstances that a person with a license to carry can do it. I would imagine you're assuming a huge liability having somebody that you have zero idea what their training is carrying around a loaded pistol on them at work while they're representing your business or your city or whatever governmental entity you happen to be representing. And I have seen some very scary incidents of people handling guns. They don't know what they're doing. Okay, you can buy a gun, but they put the bullets in the magazines backwards. They have the wrong caliber bullet for the wrong pistol. It's imperative that people take the at least initiative to get some lessons. The new law does require the Department of Public Safety to create a training course, but of course it doesn't mandate that anybody take it. In addition to the permitless carry law, I want to talk about another law that passed last session. House Bill 1069 is effective September 1, and House Bill 1069 deals with a local government with a population of 30,000 or less allowing paid first responders to carry while at work. A couple of sessions ago, a similar bill became law that applied to volunteer first responders. And the law essentially allows the local government to decide whether or not those folks can carry while they're working, but it does require certain things like a training class before that can happen. Paul, I'm wondering whether a bill like that makes sense to you. I've worked with a lot of firefighters and, you know, you see their turnout gear and to have a weapon that you have access to with the thick gloves and the thick coats and the overalls and just all the firefighter gear and then, you know, banging around, knocking down walls and, you know, breaking windows and all that kind of stuff. I I still need more information on how they would carry and as far as a high retention level holster. One part of the bill allows first responders' handguns to be stored in a lockbox in the truck. Paul, what about that? Kind of like uh, police officers keep their shotguns or their patrol rifles in those locked retention devices. And they're out there. I mean, the military has them. The police departments have them. And we beat up our cars and our military vehicles quite a bit with the weapons in there. It's hard to me to think about how it would be able to be practically employed. And if you do need it, okay, we got a wreck. We're going to, okay, take your pistol off, stick it in the box, lock it up, and then come back. It would be in the cab, which, you know, they can lock the doors, I would imagine. But I can't see it, you know, hanging on the side of the truck like an axe or a ladder. In any case, much of this will be based on the values of the community, right? A community like Austin which is very liberal as far as the mindset of the city council and the the city in general, you're probably not going to see that happening. But if you go out to some of the more conservative areas, small towns and the red counties, I see people wanting to do this and, but do it smart. Make sure you have policies in place that have been vetted and everybody is in agreement, you know, as far as the standards and the training and the policies. So it makes sense to discuss your decision with your police chief, if you have one, or other local law enforcement to get their take on it as well. Okay, we've talked about the ability to allow your employees to carry at work if you wish to do so. Let's talk about liability now. The number one question related to employee carry is, will my local government be liable if an employee shoots someone? And unfortunately, the answer is, we just can't know for sure. There's no blanket liability protection for an employer whose employee shoots someone while on duty. The only express attempt to protect a local government relates to license carry by volunteer and, come September 1, paid firefighters and EMS. Those laws do not, again, do not mandate that you allow those employees to carry while on duty, but it does on paper attempt to limit your liability if you do so. So liability for the actions of any other local government employee is governed by the state's Tort Claims Act and a federal law called Section 1983. These are extremely complex laws with hundreds of appellate cases interpreting them, so it's hard to give a three-minute explanation, but I'll give it a shot. Yes, I know. I had to reuse that pun from last time. Most local governments have something called governmental immunity. That means they can't be sued unless a specific state law allows it. The Texas Tort Claims Act is the primary state law that does so, but only in very limited circumstances. One of those is when an employee uses personal property, in this case a handgun, in a negligent way. So let's say an employee bought the wrong holster for their gun. 
He bumps up against the desk at work, the gun goes off, and it shoots a utility payment customer. Is the local government liable? It's possible because he was negligent in the use of the gun. But what about if the customer comes at him with a machete and the employee shoots and kills her? Well, that becomes an intentional act for which the local government's immunity probably won't be waived. So what about federal law? Section 1983 is a law that allows a person to sue when his civil rights have been violated. It's even more complex than the Tort Claims Act, but I'll again try to break it down. To succeed using a Section 1983 remedy, a plaintiff must prove that his constitutional rights were violated and the violation was caused by a person acting under, quote, color of law. This law is the opposite of the state law in that only intentional conduct is actionable. If an employee shoots and injures or kills a person, whether justified or not, the person or his surviving family would likely bring a Section 1983 claim based on a violation of that person's constitutional Fourth Amendment right to be free from unreasonable force. A local government can be sued under Section 1983 only when its own policies, customs, or practices cause the constitutional deprivation. That means a local government employer that adopts a policy allowing carry by its employees, or even one that has no written policy but knowingly allows employees to carry through a sort of don't ask, don't tell rule, could be liable for the actions of the employee. Of course, like with the first responder law we spoke about earlier, a local government could argue that the employee's duties did not include using a firearm, and thus an employee wasn't acting in the course and scope of employment when those shots rang out. No Texas case is considered whether liability attaches to a rank-and-file employee or her employing local government, for that matter, who, with authorization to carry at work, shoots someone. So we're not sure how it would be pled and how it would interact with your pool coverage. Okay, let's do our action items now. Action item one, do you even know if your employees are carrying at work? Your first item is to, in consultation with your local law enforcement and your attorney, talk about whether employee carry makes sense for you. And if it does, whether no policy, a written policy, or training requirements would make sense. And action item two is, no local government employer should ever tell an employee that his or her job is to, quote, police their work area, even if they're carrying. In fact, it should be made clear that the exact opposite is true, except in the rarest of circumstances when serious bodily injury or deadly force is imminent, the appropriate action is always to retreat and summon law enforcement. We don't want people thinking they're the cops now or thinking that they're out in the Wild West and take justice into their own hands. Even with the license to carry class, what they teach is that you may use deadly force in very few situations. So your second action item is to think about adopting a workplace violence policy and regular training, including actions employees should take in the event of an active shooter or any similar event. That training puts into muscle memory what to do so employees aren't running around panicking. And that's why whenever you see fire drills at schools, that's what happens. The kids go line up, walk out in the hallway, and they go out in the parking lot, sit there and goof off for a while, and then they march back in the classroom. And it's a muscle memory. Everybody knows what they have to do. And at least walk through it one time, talk about it, uh, get in that frame of mind of safety and self-defense and keeping your peers and your coworkers safe as well. That's it. Texans have strong views on gun rights one way or the other. Your culture locally will determine what you decide to do. And we want you to have the tools to understand the possible consequences of your decision. To review written materials associated with the presentation or to ask Scott a question, please visit www.tmlirp.org and click on the Stronger Together podcast link. Please remember that the information in this episode is provided for informational purposes only and doesn't constitute legal advice. We recommend that you review the podcast and the accompanying written materials with your attorney prior to taking action.